So, uh, yes, this uh, project uh, is entitled Filling Knowledge Gaps in Global Mercury Science, and it's a collection of contributions in support of the United Nations Environment Program Global Mercury Assessments, which run periodically. Since most of Canada's anthropogenic mercury that's present here comes from somewhere else now, since we have very few emissions of our own, it's, uh, it's wise for us to support the global initiatives to research and uh, regulate global mercury emissions. And the, uh, the last uh, two global assessments in 2013 and 2018, um, they were important because they help uh, policymakers, uh, they give them a state of the uh, science uh, snapshot of what we know about mercury in the environment. And we provide also some predictions about how things might change with changing emissions and uh, climate change and so on. It also is important because it provides a, a, uh, a set of priorities for research to fill some of the key knowledge gaps. And um, the, there are several activities within this project. The first two, one and two, relate to the knowledge gaps that I've, I've chosen to work on or have been able to work on, volcanic mercury emissions and uh, mercury in the ocean trench sediments. And there's also a third one on the uh, Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program's Arctic Mercury Assessment that I will um, talk about last. So the um, context for activities one and two here are really, uh, it, it, they both focus on natural processes or natural sources that impact the global mercury story. And it's fair to say that over the last 30 to 40 years, the level of research into natural processes and geogenic sources has been rather underwhelming. Uh, the vast majority of work's gone into uh, anthropogenic mercury emissions. And as a result, the total geogenic mercury emissions to air, as one example, are very poorly constrained. They, they range over about an order of magnitude from less than 10 tonnes a year globally into air, uh, up to 900 tonnes per year. And that range reflects uh, the relatively small amount of work done on, on natural geogenic emissions. Um, one of the, one of the uh, examples of this um, uh, lack of work is that in Iceland, which you'd think because of its volcanic nature would actually be a, a key study site, had some work done in the 1970s that reported extremely high natural emissions of mercury into, into air, many tens of thousands of nanograms of mercury per cubic metre uh, in ground level concentrations, compared to the usual ambient background concentrations of around one to two. So tens of thousands is, is an enormous uh, number, and it was all over Iceland in, in the 1970s, according to the few studies that were done then, uh, but no one's done any work since. So uh, activity one is uh, a PhD student, Brock Edwards, supported by the EGP to look at Icelandic mercury emissions again. And then another key um, lack is uh, oceans as a final resting place for the mercury in the environment, both natural and anthropogenic. And again, because of very uh, limited sampling, especially in the deep ocean, uh, because of the difficulties, uh, there's been no actual sampling of deep ocean sediments until the, the study that I'm gonna be talking about here. So um, the, first, uh, the first activity is to say volcanic mercury emissions. The goal is to help to start to fill in the gap in this, uh, part of the, of the natural mercury cycle. It was a gap identified in the 2013 and 2018 assessments. And Fei Wang at the University of Manitoba has decided uh, to work on this. And uh, I've been part of, uh, of his project for actually a couple of years, even before Brock Edwards came on board. Uh, we focused on Iceland. We originally wanted to send Brock to sample a variety of different volcanic systems around the world. But because of the COVID travel restrictions, that was impossible. We decided to go to Iceland, not only because it's relevant uh, scientifically, but also it's relatively easy to get into. And uh, um, so Brock has made uh, three trips there already and with a fourth one planned this August. So you can see him there um, on the right, the picture is him uh, setting up a passive air sampler near the, uh, near the Fisher eruption that happened last year. He just happened to be, be there when that fissure erupted. So 
generally his progress has been very good. He's on schedule to finish uh, late 2023. And the project team members here, you can see a picture on the right there. Um, a key component or a key partner in this is the Icelandic Meteorological Office. Uh, they do a lot of major volcanic gas sampling, sulfur dioxide, uh, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide. And Melissa Pfeffer and Michelle Parks, who you see there, are our partners on the ground. Faye Wang, prof from University of Manitoba, who's the academic co-supervisor as well as Hamid Snai from Aarhus and Bruce, Bruce Kiergaard from GSC are contributing as well. So uh, the progress here has been uh, very good in the last year. Um, Brock, as I said, has made three trips with the last one in August last year. He's completed his coursework and he uh, has been focused recently on passive and active sampling of uh, gaseous mercury coming out of the erupting uh, Fisher, the name of which I can't pronounce and I won't even try. Um, another thing that he has, um, well, be because we weren't able to send him to uh, all of the sites we wanted to around the world, we've sort of adapted the project to look at the, the sampling methods. And uh, as you can imagine, sampling trace mercury concentrations from hot sulfurous uh, volcanic gases is, is not an easy task and a variety of methods have been used by different groups. No one's actually done any comparison of those methods. So he's uh, been partly working on that. He's also uh, developed a new flux measure measurement method for soil mercury emissions, which is adapted from uh, volcanic organic contaminant uh, science. And this is the first time this has been adapted or adapted to mercury and it seems to work very well. Uh, he's also using uh, Lumex um, mercury instrument to do real-time measurements and compare those data to the concentration data gathered from active and passive samplers. This is just one of the um, examples of the soil gas data that he has collected already. He sampled uh, six geothermal areas and Eldforp is one of them. This is uh, about a one square kilometer shown here on the screen and, and you'll see Based on the color code on the right hand side here, the gaseous elemental mercury flux or gem flux, you'll see there are two hot spots out of this approximately kilometer square area, uh, ELD 59 and 88. On the left here, you'll see uh, delta C. So this delta C is the difference in concentration from 10 centimeters in the ground to ground level. And you can see one value of 2450 nanograms per cubic meter. That's the difference in concentration from 10 centimeters to ground. And remember the ground concentrations are between one and two nanograms per cubic meter. So uh, at 10 centimeters depth, the concentration was uh, about 2450 nanograms per cubic meter. And then at L88, an even higher concentration, uh, 88, uh, 8655 nanograms per cubic meter. And you can see the soil mercury concentrations too, almost 20,000 nanograms per gram uh, at, these hots, at the uh, 59 site and 7,000 nanograms per gram at the 88 site. By comparison, the global average soil mercury concentration is around 60 nanograms per gram. So these are extremely high, but these are, as you can see, very constrained um, spatially. So if you look at the aerial average within this uh, LVORP uh, geothermal area, it's actually a relatively low flux. And uh, there's obviously a geological uh, underbending for this, maybe the fractures in rocks underneath these hotspots. Um, but we wanna go back uh, next uh, in uh, August to sample more geothermal areas and to increase the sampling frequency around some of these hotspots that were identified here and at other geothermal sites uh, in August last year. But in any case, the, the methodology to do this, the 10 centimeter hole, which is a, just taken out with a, with a hand auger, um, seems to be um, giving us uh, a, a picture of subsurface soil mercury that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And another uh, novel thing that Brock has got into is uh, drone-based airborne sampling of volcanic plumes. Obviously, you can imagine you can't just walk over to uh, a lava flow and sample the, the air above the lava. So he's uh, started working with uh, a scientist from the University of Leeds, Evgenis, you can see here, 
uh, who's been sampling other particulate metals in volcanic plumes using drone and uh, Brock has uh, put an active sampler on her drone and they've been flying around the, the fissure eruption, which you can see in the background there. Uh, and this is gonna be something that Fei Wang uh, is gonna do a lot more of. He's actually buying a drone of his own and Brock has done a, a Canadian drone operator certification course. So he'll be able to do a lot more of this work. Uh, the only real potential problem here is that you might be recruited by the Ukrainian army and sent to the, sent to the Russian front but uh, hopefully that won't happen before he finishes his PhD. But it is certainly a, uh, has a lot of advantages in terms of direct sampling close to eruptions that we couldn't do for safety reasons. The uh, second activity related to the, the global mercury assessments um, was a, a bit of a one-off. I was invited to be part of a mercury study by Hamid Sinai, who was associated with the, with the Hadal research group at the University of Southern Denmark, where Ronnie Glude is the uh, head of that group. And uh, the Hadal research group is, is funded and interested in the carbon cycle in deep ocean trenches and also microbial ecology. So uh, they had all these core samples and uh, we were lucky enough to uh, be able to analyze mercury concentrations there and to develop um, the first ever um, mercury flux numbers for deep ocean sediments. And that resulted in this paper in scientific reports last year. The, the key finding here is that the fluxes that we measured in two uh, out of the, there are 48 trenches in the, in the world's oceans. We only were able to get samples from two, but those two trenches have many times higher of sediment mercury fluxes than existing ocean models predict that would suggest if that result applies to other trenches that the rate of removal of mercury from ocean waters is much faster than uh, ocean models predict and that uh, also tells us um, something worrying about the reliability of those models which are the basis or part of the basis for united nations uh, predictions about how mercury levels in the environment will change because it's the first off, it's been a very uh, popular uh, paper. So it's in the 98th percentile of downloads, according to nature.com, uh, since it was published a year ago. And we're hoping to, um, uh, well, certainly the Hadal group is, is already going out to sample other trenches. Uh, and there are now Chinese uh, research groups getting interested in deep ocean trenches and mercury as well. So we are going to, very quickly move from a state of no data to uh, a very interesting and very complete data set very quickly. So that's a, a good thing. But I hope we'll be able to be part of that uh, as well. Finally, um, activity three, this is um, simply a wrap up of the Arctic monitor assessment and assessment programs, Arctic mercury assessment from last year. The Arctic is important um, in a global context because it's regarded as sort of a bellwether of what's going on uh, because there are no uh, anthropogenic sources to speak of in the Arctic anywhere. So what's going on there uh, represents, um, uh, well, also because it, it also is where uh, some of the highest human and mercury exposure anywhere in the world occurs because uh, people are eating wild foods that are heavily contaminated with mercury. So. From that point of view, it's important from a global perspective as well. But the AMAP assessment, which um, hopefully will be published in June, uh, the, the different chapters there have been turned into a peer reviewed journal articles uh, and a suit of store from Environment Canada led one, which has come out in Nature Reviews, Earth and the Environment. And John Chatteler, also from Environment Canada, uh, headed up one on climate change and mercury in the Arctic which came out in Stoughton this year. So that's a very nice uh, finale to uh, what's been a very interesting process with AMAP. And there are my contact details and I'll leave it there. Hopefully I have time for questions, thanks.